thank you everyone for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Um, I really want this to be an interactive session. And so, you know, I want to hear your voices. Um, I also realize that it's four o'clock on a Saturday, right? And so gosh knows what's happened in the hours leading up to four o'clock on a Saturday. And so I see that um, most of you have actually muted your video. And this is actually an exercise that I'm going to ask everyone to do for just two minutes. And then when we come back together, um, I'm going to ask you to, you know, put your video back on. But we're going to take two minutes to um, really think about the question of, do you consider yourself a leader? Okay. And so every time I start a session, we take two minutes of peace and reflection to really think about uh, prompt, um, but also to turn off the noise of the day, right, and to become really present with ourselves. So I'm going to go ahead and mute my video too. We'll take two minutes and think about, do you consider yourself a leader? Okay, let's begin. Okay, I'll invite everyone to come back to us. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so I prompted you to think about the idea of, do you consider yourself a leader? And over the course of the presentation, I want you to consider that, right? And what it was about that that, that encouraged you to answer yes or no. Um, and then at the end, we'll do a little check-in with ourselves to see if the answer to that has changed, okay? So can everyone, can everyone see my screen? Okay, I'm actually, I'm, look, I'm using dual monitors. And so if I'm looking over here, it's only because I'm rearranging a couple of things. Okay, so you'll see that I have a, a riddle up here on the screen. Okay, and so I want everyone to um, start utilizing your voices. I want this to be something that you're engaged in and that you're not just listening to me. Um, and so the rules of this, um, engagement in a riddle are that you can ask me yes or no questions, okay? Um, and if you figure out the answer, I don't want you to say the answer. I want you to continue to ask questions to help your peers get there, okay? And so we're thinking about curiosity. We're thinking about what questions we ask, right? So you can ask me yes and no questions. A prison you feel safe in, yet never quite happy. Whenever you try to leave, it only grows bigger. What am I? So yes and no questions. Can you touch it? No. Okay, I just gave you the first one. Go ahead. Oh, Janet, I think you're talking, but you're on mute. I can't hear you. Is it the same for everybody? No. Great question. Does it change over time? Yes. What other questions are there? Can you see it? No. Is it part of why we all went to Moravian College? You know, some might argue yes, but I'll, I'll say the answer in general would be no. Do we all have one? Yes. Is it two words? Yes. Comfort zone? 
Oh, Morgan. <laughs> so Morgan got it. <laughs> um, but okay, so, so the premise is right, your comfort zone, right? A prison you feel safe in yet never quite happy. Whenever you try to leave, it only grows bigger. What am I? So in this, in this notion today of thinking about leading from any seat, I really want you to think about your comfort zone. I want you to think about the prompt that encouraged you to answer yes or no, do you consider yourself a leader? And how you're encouraging yourself and the people around you to move out of your comfort zone, okay? I open every class I teach with a riddle. It encourages lateral thinking, but also prompts us to think about our point of entry, right? In the way that we respond to questions. And sometimes that point of entry is not on target. Right? So what is it about that to help us to start to move, right, our thinking into new spaces and no pun intended, right, but out of our comfort zone, right? And so we'll talk a lot about that today. All right. So here's the playlist. We'll get acclimated. We're going to do a values exercise. Um, we'll go through the model that I use in my teaching and recognize, reflect, connect, and then we'll talk about how we can collectively inspire lollipop moments. Sound good? Any questions so far? Awesome. Take yourself off mute if you have questions, okay? Because this is your space and your time. So I'm gonna make sure that it's as valuable as possible, okay? And so what I'd like to do here is in the, in the chat, I am gonna share a document for all of you, but I'll also put it up on the screen. But if you would like to, um, reference this values exercise, you'll have access to it on your computers as well. So I just put that values exercise in the chat. Okay, and so when we go through this exercise together, um, it's really important for us, you know, whether we're in a position, a leadership position or not, to understand our core values, right? Those, those beliefs that we have that kind of fuel action Okay, and so as we go through this exercise, we'll, we'll look at recognizing what your espoused values mean, reflecting how you enact, right? And I have ACT in capital letters, your values, and then connect with why your values create meaning. And, and I really want in this exercise for you to think about when we think about what we espouse, right? What we say is important to us. Do we enact that, right? Does that come alive in our behaviors, right? Do those two match or is there a disparity in some ways in what we say versus what we do, okay? And so I'd like everyone to take a moment and go through the exercise and, and here's the, the values exercise if you didn't open it on your computer, but take a couple moments to just go through this. And if you can, I know it's hard because you probably look at this list and you can add more onto the list that I have here, right? It's hard to come down to just three or four values. But go ahead and take a moment to do that and then we'll talk about it. I'll give everyone about five minutes or so to go through this.
Stop. As you're going through this exercise, if you're coming to a few values that you might say, well, I'm not sure if it's this or this, hopefully when you think about that action orientation, it will help you get to the core. And I'll give you the example that for many years, I would have said that, that family is a, va a core value of mine. And really when I learned um, more about you know, my actions, it's, it's connection. Um, and so I have people in my life that are not family, right, but that I'm deeply connected to. Um, and my actions, right, actually encourage that, okay? And I think, too, that, um, you know, when I lived in the townhouse right next door to my sister, um, and my sister and I are married to brothers, by the way, um, and she just had her first baby, um, we, again, live right next door, saw each other every day, and I decided to sell my car, quit my job, and moved to South Florida to pursue this dream of mine, right? Moving into higher education, not knowing if I would ever come back again, right? So that value of family, right, became in question because, you know, if, if we're so important, I remember everyone being so upset with me. Why are you moving, right? Um, and really it was about connection and I can stay connected no matter where I am in the world, right? And my actions, um, you know, um, will speak to that. We'll take a couple more minutes. And if anyone has questions, feel free to ask them. Okay. Does anyone need more time? All right. So for everyone that's here, is this the first time that you've thought about your core values? No. For those of you that have thought about your core values, tell me about the exercise of you thinking about how your values are turned into action. Was this easy for you to do? Did it encourage you to really think or stretch. Tell me about that process. Yeah, Katie, I, I guess I would just like to say, I think the past few minutes like really was an opportunity for me to reflect back on um, things that I do value. And I think all of us at the end of the day, when we are in professional roles and we do have busy lives, we don't take as much time to reflect on things that we truly um, value and appreciate at the end of the day. You know, and especially I think now in COVID um, times where everything is, you know, sort of virtual and, and we're all kind of all over the place with um, responsibilities and, and our professional um, capabilities that we should take more of the time now than ever to sit back and reflect on um, what we can improve on. I love that, Justin, and you're 100% right, right? And this encourages this presence too with ourselves to understand where we are, to understand how we're communicating, right? In a lot of ways, our behaviors um, come out in our body language, right? And sometimes at the end of the day, we're not taking that time to reflect, right? And two, are we enacting what we espouse to be true about ourselves, right? That then helps us build credibility in a space of working with other human beings, right? So that's really, really important. As we go through 
um, you know, our time together, I want you to continue to think about your values, right? Think about the action orientation of how your values come to life, right? Using your values as a means to an end, right? That mobilization of where are you headed and how are your values really part of that fuel that's, that's moving you and the people that you're working with forward, okay? And so I love this quote, as a leader, you teach, coach, and guide others to align their actions with the shared values, you're held accountable for their actions too, not just your own, right? So in thinking about that, and there's a, an important element of communication there is when you're working with others, are you communicating a shared vision, right? Are you communicating something that's tethered to the work that you're doing as a group or as an organization that helps mobilize those behaviors to ensure that there's alignment there, okay? And so does anyone know what this acronym stands for? D-W-Y-S-Y-W-D? Anyone? Do what you say you will do. Oh my goodness. Do what you say you will do. That, you know, that sounds so simple, right? Do what you, of course, like, of course I'll do what I say I will do, but no, right? As humans, oftentimes we say what we think people want to hear. We say what we think we should say, right? But are our actions matching our words? So do what you say you will do. So, so important. It goes back to, to what, what values are you saying are important to you? And are those coming to life in, in your behaviors, right? And so as we build credibility, regardless of our role, and I'm here to talk today about this notion of leading from any seat, right? So we don't have to be in a position of power to be a leader. And two, we could be in a position of power and not be a leader. Okay, and so there's a space there of thinking of our influence on moving human beings forward. And at the core of that is, is our credibility, right? How we encourage our influence in mobilizing others, right? So we have to mindfully take action, but really, and, and Justin, you said this so beautifully earlier, is how at the end of the day are we reflecting? How aware are we of that influence that we have, right? So do what you say you will do, so important. And I often think about this you know, even at the college, if, if I have a deliverable or if I, you know, of course, I'm always like, yes, yeah, sign me up, right? I get so impassioned and so excited to be part of things that sometimes it's just not possible. And so it's important to manage expectations to say, I love that you invited me to do this, you know, invite me again. And while I can't help you this time, I, I'll help you again, right? So while I struggle with no, it doesn't always have to be no, but how am I building credibility? Because when I say I'm gonna show up, I wanna show up, right? If I say I'm gonna deliver something, I'm gonna deliver it. And if I can't, right, then I have to manage expectations to make sure, right, that people do wanna invite me to come back again in the future, okay? Any questions or comments on that? Do what you say you will do. All right. So this is my Recognize, Reflect, Connect framework that I use in all of my teaching, and I'll kind of ground our discussion in this today. So first in recognize, recognizing what, right? So what do you mean? And I have some punctuation there that we'll talk about in a slide or two, but in this space of self-awareness, right? And, and it goes back to Justin's comment earlier, is are we recognizing what we mean? So when we choose language, do we understand the implications of that language on other people, right? And, and two, are we mindful that it's not what we say, it's how we say it, right? So, that, so in the space of recognizing, right, we have to be mindful of what we mean and are people interpreting what we mean in the way that we intend? Okay, so important. And that too is in a space of, even as I talk about the notion of leading from any seat, as you're having influence on people that you work with on your teams or in cross-functional teams, or perhaps in ways that you don't even know how, right? Because someone hasn't told you yet, right? That understanding of creating meaning becomes really powerful, okay? And so I often talk about this space of priming right? Does anyone here know what priming means? Is it like preparing yourself to do something else or preparing for like a large task? Well, and you know what, Steve, it doesn't even have, and, and do you prefer Steve or Steven? Steve. Steve, okay. So, so um, it doesn't have to be a big task, 
But to your point, it's about, it's about that mental preparation, that mental self-talk that's encouraging, right? You to think something that actually comes out in your behaviors. But then sometimes we say things that prime others, right? And so it could be, right, that, you know, you, you stand up to deliver a presentation and you say, now, what if I said this to you? Okay, I, you know, I know it's four o'clock and you probably don't want to be here. What? Like, I, well, I just primed you to think that you don't want to be here, right? No, right? So there's a priming space of what we think, right, that encourages our beliefs that comes out in the way that we interact with others, okay? And so it's important in that space of, of recognizing, right, that self-reflection piece, having self-awareness of what are our thoughts, right? What language are we using and what's the implications? I think back to, to you know, the time when I was the chair of the economics and business department and I had just had my second child um, and I was feeling just so overwhelmed and in a way that felt liberating in many ways, right? Because in one space, I was the first female chair, right? At the sixth oldest college and the first to educate women, I was honored to serve in that role. But in, in other ways, I felt like I just couldn't keep up, right? It was so much. And I found myself in the priming space of using the word busy. So busy, right? So busy. And I realized that busy had negative implications on me, but it also had implications on all of the faculty and staff and students that I was working with every day. And I had to own that, right? So I erased the word busy, right? I don't use the word busy now. My days are full. My days are fruitful, right? I want my days to be action-oriented. I don't want to be bored. I don't want to be apathetic. But I also know that I need to mobilize the people around me and ask for help where I need it. I need to be able to communicate, right, those spaces. And so in the priming phase, we have to be able to own that, okay? Any questions or comments on that? So how many people here have heard of the Pygmalion effect? Okay, what, what is the Pygmalion effect? Anyone wanna say? So we see here, right, our beliefs about others influence our actions towards others, which impact others' beliefs about themselves and cause others' actions towards us to reinforce our own beliefs, right? And so there's this space of, right, when if someone else believes in us, all of a sudden, this is what we see. Oh my gosh, let me go back because this is too important. Let me show you this. So this is what we see in the Pygmalion effect. When, when someone believes in us, right? We might not be there yet, but we have the self-efficacy, the belief in our ability to, right? And so we have to be able to own this, right? For ourselves as leaders, how are we demonstrating that we believe in people to motivate them, to move them, to mobilize them? But then two, what are our beliefs about ourselves? And are we standing in our own way in the space of leadership, right? Where we say, I will be a leader when I get this role. I will be a leader when I have a team. I will be a leader when, no. You can actually lead right now, right here, right now, right? In having influence on others, okay? In really, really meaningful ways without position or rank or title, okay? But we have to think about those beliefs first, right? And how that's fueling action. Okay. And so, and, and I love this, right? We have to think about the people that we surround ourselves with, right? And, and really, and when we look at this, when we replace the I with we, illness becomes wellness. Okay, and so this is so powerful that oftentimes too, from a leadership perspective, we think I have to do it all. I'm the one, right? And go back to my example of being the chair of the department. I put so much pressure on myself of what I had to do, but how am I mobilizing us? How am I bringing people together, right? To reach our big potential, okay? And so that space there, right? When you replace I 
with we, illness becomes wellness, right? And so to really consider that and how we're bringing this to life every day in the work that we're doing and how we're mobilizing the people around us. Any questions so far? All right, so, so I promised this, right? How are you creating meaning? And I wanna introduce my favorite punctuation mark, okay? The marriage of the question mark and the exclamation points. Does anyone know what this is called? Anyone? Let me introduce you to the interrobang, okay? My favorite punctuation mark. And we know that punctuation was designed to create meaning, okay? So when we choose our punctuation, right, we have to think about that mindfully, right? How are we creating meaning when we communicate using punctuation? I have the Interabring pre-programmed on my cell phone so that if I'm sending a text message, I always get the Interabring in there, right? This beautiful marriage of joining curiosity with shared forms of expression. And so as a leader, I ensure that I'm bringing the Interabring to life in my interactions with others. I'm really curious, right? If I'm sensing that something, something is off with you or you have something on your mind, I wanna know. I'm gonna ask you a lot of questions. I'm gonna check in. How are you doing, right? What do you need? But then two, I'm gonna share forms of expression with a lot of punctuation marks, right? And it might not always be excited, right? A lot of punctuation marks could mean I'm really upset right now too, right? If I put something in all capital letters followed by some, but that I'm sharing vulnerably expression. And so there's a space there of when you're, when you're marrying the two, you're making connection, right? But you're making connection with others too. And so to think about how you're doing that as you work with and through others becomes really, really powerful, okay? So uh, Martin Spector was the man who came up with the, the interrobang um, and it almost made it to the keyboard, but you know, you can find it if you search in wingdings, if you really want it on your keyboard, okay? We can talk offline about that. All right, so how you lead depends mainly on what lens you choose, okay? Think about this, how you lead depends mainly on what lens you choose. And so go back to this idea of priming what is the self-talk? What lens are you putting on as you do whatever it is that you're going to do? As you came into this session, right? I'm signed up for this session. I'm investing time. What will be my return on investment, right? How are you rolling up your sleeves to really engage in this opportunity for us to be together, right? To have discussions together, to share ideas and learnings and you know, the space that we walk out richer after, right? And so, too, I even think about um, when it's raining outside, and, and before I had my oldest daughter, I used to think, right, I'd look outside and say, oh, it's raining, right? Like, the days that, like, I don't even want to do my hair today. But when I had my daughter, when she was two years old, she loved the rain, and she felt the feeling of the pitter-patter of rain on her head. And I used to take her outside so that she could feel the rain on her head, right? And so in the space of choosing your lens, every time I see that it's drizzling outside or that it's raining, I'm like, Lily is gonna be so excited, right? The lens that I choose now when I see rain is so different. And metaphorically, how do we translate that into just everyday opportunities, right? To, and this is my favorite saying, and this is how I really operationalize success, right? Is, is to fall up because we are gonna stumble in life, right? We are gonna make mistakes. We are going to have to regroup and recover, but how are we choosing to learn, choosing to grow, right? Choosing to fall up and use these stumbling blocks as opportunities to grow, right? We choose that. We get to choose the lens, right? That we're applying as we're working with and through others, as we're just navigating life in general, right? So to fall up, we don't fall down, we fall up. And so why should you care? And this is really at the heart of my model, right? In Recognize, Reflect, Connect, is human beings want to connect. We want to connect with each other. We want to connect and build our, our competencies, right? We want to connect 
in um, learning about each other and new things and new ideas, right? And so in this space of connection, we have to be mindful of how we're bringing this to life, right? In the conversations that we're encouraging, in our curiosity, in the way that we are connecting with the work that we do and the people that we work with and through. And so you'll see around the model, I have these four areas, right? Compassion, stability, trust, and hope. And these are the four basic needs of followers, okay? And so we can think about this about ourselves as followers, but we can also think about this in our space of influence of how we're encouraging people to feel, right? That compassion, stability, hope, and trust are present. We're in this space of a, of a global pandemic, right? Lots has changed. People might be feeling, you know, a, a lots of forms of distress, right? And maybe some forms of the healthy form of you stress, right? But we're in this space of change. And so now more than ever, how are we creating an environment, right? Where, where followers feel fulfilled, right? They can feel hope and compassion and some sense of stability, right? In trusting that you're moving forward, right? These are opportunities that are going to be uncomfortable, right? There may be some devastation, right? But how do we mobilize ourselves to go ahead, right? To keep going, find new ways, okay? Um, any questions or comments here? Okay, and so here I have how we grow depends mainly on what seeds we plant. And this goes back to what language are we choosing, right? As we're planting seeds, right? As we're encouraging others to grow, how are we encouraging this sense of the Pygmalion effect to invest in others, right? To drop those little nuggets of hope, of people believing in themselves, right? Of encouraging that mobilization for people to be able to really willing to take risks, to move out of, our, and, I, and I go back to our opening riddle, to move out of our comfort zones, right? And we do that together, okay? And so I'm referencing here a bit of Sean Aker's work. Has anyone here read Sean Aker's either The Happiness Advantage, which is one of my favorites, or his most recent book, um, Big Potential, okay? And so this comes from his most recent book, Big Potential, right? When we talk about planting seeds, right? He says, surround, right? In the acronym of SEEDS, the first is surround. Surround yourself with positive influencers to create a star system where you can shine. So, so there's an action orientation here of reflection. Who are the people that you're surrounding yourself with? Are they moving you forward? Are they building you up? Are they allowing you to shine? Are you part of the contribution of being um, part of someone else's star system, right? And how are you encouraging their growth, right? And their ability to shine. The E, expand. Expand your power by leading from any seat and inspiring others to do the same, right? Use your voice. Find ways that you can have positive influence, especially in this time, right? Where there's so many opportunities to think about positive change and positive growth, those opportunities forward. The second E, enhance. Enhance your resources of energy, creativity, and motivation, right? And in that space of enhancement, right, people won't do that when they're not in a safe environment where they don't trust. So think about the environment that you work in. Think about the environment that you create where people can feel, right, that they can enhance those resources of energy, creativity, and motivation. The D, defend. So defend the system against attacks on your productivity, drive, and positivity. And th this is something really funny. And so um, some of my closest friends call me a reckless optimist. And I just love that. I'm always like, oh, thank you. Like, thank you so much for calling me a reckless optimist. I love that, right? I'm always going to find the way forward. I'll always find the silver lining. Things won't always be great, right? I'm human. Life is not easy, right? We have to be able to navigate this um, together, but how are we defending against attacks, right? That we're finding those spaces to fall up, that we're looking for those silver linings to grow, right? To become stronger, to build relationships, um, and, and two, to be human, right? That we won't always be happy, we won't always be joyful, right? But that we have people that we can call on 
right, to encourage, right, that growth, that we're not just staying in a space, right, where we're kind of wallowing in our own self-misery, right? So really important. And then the final S, sustain. Sustain collective momentum to push your performance to new levels, right? Being better tomorrow than you are today, right? That's that, that fuel to action in thinking about forever growing, right? And so this is the space for me is like, you know, I'm always looking for more, right? I want to create, I'm a pioneer, right? I want to look at those opportunities to, you know, invest and grow and create and shape. And they might not always work, right? But it's going to move me in ways that, that I have high challenge, right? But that I'm growing, right? And how do I help the people around me um, grow with me? So, so really important there. Any questions on seeds? Okay. And so I'm gonna turn on this video. We're gonna close here with this video and then we'll open it up for discussion. Sound good? Okay, so lollipop moments. Here we go, I love this one. How many of you are completely comfortable with calling yourselves a leader? See, I've asked that question all the way across the country and everywhere I ask it, no matter where, there's always a huge portion of the audience that won't put up their hand. And I've come to realize that we have made leadership into something bigger than us. We made it into something beyond us. We made it about changing the world. And we've taken this title of leader and we treat it as if it's something that one day we're going to deserve. But to give it to ourselves right now means a level of arrogance or cockiness that we're not comfortable with. And I worry sometimes that we spend so much time celebrating amazing things that hardly anybody can do that we've convinced ourselves that those are the only things we're celebrating. And we Katie, start I'm to sorry develop. to interrupt. Are we supposed to be able to see something? We can hear the audio, but I can't see anything. We don't let ourselves take credit for it, and we don't let ourselves feel good about it. Yes. And I've been lucky enough over the last... You can't see it. That's so strange. So let me actually come off share screen. Stop share. Thank you for thank you for telling me, Amanda, because I saw it so perfectly oh. on my screen, right? This is this virtual space, right? Um, so let me actually pull it up here. share screen this way. Okay, can everyone see now? Yep. Everyone see? Okay, thank you, perfect. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy that you told me, Amanda, and didn't tell me at the end. Here we go. are completely comfortable with calling yourselves a leader. See, I've asked that question all the way across the country and everywhere I ask it, no matter where, there's always a huge portion of the audience that won't put up their hand. And I've come to realize that we have made leadership into something bigger than us. We made it into something beyond us. We made it about changing the world. And we've taken this title of leader and we treat it as if it's something that one day we're going to deserve. But to give it to ourselves right now means a level of arrogance or cockiness that we're not comfortable with. And I worry sometimes that we spend so much time celebrating amazing things that hardly anybody can do that we've convinced ourselves that those are the only things we're celebrating. And we start to devalue the things that we can do every day. And we start to take moments where we truly are a leader and we don't let ourselves take credit for it and we don't let ourselves feel good about it. And I've been lucky enough over the last 10 years to work with some amazing people who have helped me redefine leadership in a way that I think has made me happier. And with my short time today, I just want to share with you the one story that is probably most re responsible for that redefinition. I went to a school in a little school called Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. And on my last day there, a girl came up to me and she said, I remember the first time that I met you. 
And then she told me a story that happened four years earlier. She said, on my day before I started university, I was in the hotel room with my mom and my dad. And I was so scared and so convinced that I couldn't do this, that I wasn't ready for university, that I just burst into tears. And my mom and my dad were amazing. They were like, look, we know you're scared, but let's just go tomorrow. Let's go in the first day. And if at any point you feel as if you can't do this, that's fine. Just tell us we will take you home. We love you no matter what. And she says, so I went the next day and I was standing in line getting ready for registration. And I looked around and I just knew I couldn't do it. I knew I wasn't ready. I knew I had to quit. And she says, I made that decision. And as soon as I made it, there was this incredible feeling of peace that came over me. And I turned to my mom and my dad to tell them that we needed to go home. And just at that moment, you came out of the student union building wearing the stupidest hat I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> and you had a big sign uh, promoting Shiner M, which is Students Fighting Cystic Fibrosis, a charity I've worked with for years. And you had a bucket full of lollipops. And you were walking along and you were handing the lollipops out to people in line and talking about Shiner M. And all of a sudden, you got to me, and you just stopped, and you stared. It was creepy. <laughs> this girl right here knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then you looked at the guy next to me, and you smiled, and you reached in your bucket, you pulled out a lollipop, and you held it out to him. And you said, you need to give a lollipop to the beautiful woman standing next to you. And she said, I have never seen anyone get more embarrassed faster in my life. He turned beet red, and he wouldn't even look at me. He just kind of held the lollipop out like this. <laughs> And I felt so bad for this dude that I took the lollipop. And as soon as I did, you got this incredibly severe look on your face. And you looked at my mom and my dad. And you said, look at that. Look at that. First day away from home. And already she's taking candy from a stranger. <laughs> and she said, everybody lost it. 20 feet in every direction. Everyone started to howl. And I know this is cheesy. And I don't know why I'm telling you this. But in that moment when everyone was laughing, I knew that I shouldn't quit. I knew that I was where I was supposed to be. And I knew that I was home. And I haven't spoken to you once in the four years since that day, but I heard that you were leaving. And I had to come up and tell you that you've been an incredibly important person in my life, and I'm going to miss you. Good luck. And she walks away, and I'm flattened. And she gets about six feet away, she turns around and smiles and goes, you should probably know this too. I'm still dating that guy four years later. <laughs> a year and a half after I moved to Toronto, I got an invitation to their wedding. Here's the kicker. I don't remember that. I have no recollection of that moment, and I've searched my memory banks because that is funny, and I should remember doing it, and I don't remember it. And that was such an eye-opening, transformative moment for me to think that the, maybe the biggest impact I'd ever had on anyone's life, a moment that had a, a woman walk up to a stranger four years later and say, you've been an incredibly important person in my life, was a moment that I didn't even remember. How many of you guys have a lollipop moment, a moment where someone said something or did something that you feel fundamentally made your life better? All right. How many of you have told that person they did it? See, why not? We celebrate birthdays where all you have to do is not die for 365 days. <laughs> and yet we let people who have made our lives better walk around without knowing it. And every single one of you, every single one of you has been the catalyst for a lollipop moment. You have made someone's life better by something that you said or that you did. And if you think you have it, think about all the hands that didn't go back up when I asked that question. You're just one of the people who hasn't been told. But it is so scary to think of ourselves as that powerful. It can be frightening to think that we can matter that much to other people. Because as long as we make leadership something bigger than us, as long as we keep leadership something beyond us, as long as we make it about changing the world, we give ourselves an excuse not to expect it every day from ourselves and from each other. Marianne Williamson said, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that frightens us. And my call to action today is that we need to get over that. We need to get over our fear of how extraordinarily powerful we can be in each other's lives. We need to get over it so we can move beyond it. And our little brothers and our little sisters, and one day our kids, or our kids right now, can watch us start to value the impact we can have on each other's lives more than money and power and titles and influence. We need to redefine leadership as being about lollipop moments. How many of them we create, how many of them we acknowledge, how many of them we pay forward, and how many of them we say thank you for. Because we've made leadership about changing the world, and there is no world. There's only six billion understandings of it. And if you change one person's understanding of it, one person's understanding of what they're capable of, one person's understanding of how much people care about them, one person's understanding of how powerful an agent for change they can be in this world, you change the whole thing. And if we can change, understand leadership like that, I think if we can redefine leadership like that, I think we can change everything. And it's a simple idea. But I don't think it's a small one. And I want to thank you all so much for letting me share it with you today. Okay. So I want to open it up for questions, comments. What are your thoughts?
Has anyone here heard of lollipop moments before? Yeah. I have some yeses and noes. So what do you think? What's resonated with you? What have been your aha moments in our time together? I think the most resonant thing for me was the picture of the cat and then looking into the puddle and then seeing a bigger image of herself. Yeah. Good. Seeing the lion, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's powerful, right? And so to think about how we see ourselves, right? When we look in the mirror, right? What do we see? And go back, going back to our two minutes of peace and reflection and me asking you, do you consider yourself a leader? If anyone said no, right? What is it? about that, that the answer was no, right? And how are you finding the ways, right, to look in the mirror and surrounding yourself with the people that fuel you to believe in your abilities and, and your influence and the ability to share those? Good, what else? I wanna go back to the value values. Um, I actually have been doing leadership development for years and <laughs> I use value cards with most of my clients. And one mm -hmm. of the things we have about 55 values and I get them to get, go to their top two or three and they carry those values with them. And one of the things that I do a lot with stress um, with people is if you are stressed, it's because one of your values is compromised. So for example, if you are, in a situation at work and someone is dishonest and one of your values is honesty, um, you get very upset and, um, and you get very stressed out because it's affecting that. If one of your values is balance, uh, work-life balance, um, and you don't have that, um, your stress level goes up, your blood pressure goes up. Um, so I think the values exercise is incredibly important for us to know who we are what's really meaningful and valuable. And I think the other thing that, that you raised, Katie, which I think is extremely important is vulnerability. Um, and I think when you make yourself vulnerable to another person, you allow yourself to be vulnerable as a leader. Um, it gives the other person permission to do the same. Mm -hmm. um, if you're somebody that's always together and you always have the right thing to say and you're dressed impeccably and you know you, you never talk about you know the crummy night you had or the kid waking up and having to go to the emergency room um, who's going to come and tell you anything so yeah. I think that I think that vulnerability is 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 really important and um, I know you mentioned in the early part one of my favorite books is flow um, and Chesnovsky, who, who really talks about how do we have a life that's in balance, that's in flow, and how do we yeah. stay present to that flow, which is so simple, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, and, and I love that you went back to flow, right, or being in the zone, right, and finding that space where we have high challenge, but it's met by high skill, right, the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to meet that challenge. Um, and the environment is conducive to that, right? So there are triggers, right, that kind of move us in and out of the flow state. But to your point, how do we channel those opportunities, right, for us to reach, you know, that space or self-actualization, um, which, which, you know, becomes a sweet spot for people. Um, and I love that you brought this up too, Janet, because as, a, as a, um, an athlete my whole life, you know, I experienced flow, you know, on the soccer field as a marathon runner, right? I would lose my sense of self, right? High challenge. I'd forget what was happening. I'd, I'd finish and, and I would want to do it again, right? And you're like, how, how, right? When you're in the space of, of high challenge, right? But your knowledge, skills, and attitudes meeting that. And it encouraged that curiosity of how we bring that to life at work. Um, and I know Chicksamahaya has done some work there in good business too. Um, but you know, I, I, I'd love to see more of that conversation. So I love that you're doing this work in leadership development to, to encourage those reflections, right? And performance optimization in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Anyone else? Okay, so, um, you know, I, I wanna just open up that if anyone wants to continue this conversation, you know, talk offline, um, you can get my contact information from Amanda or Justin. Um, my, my email and phone number are also on the website. If you just, you know, searched my name in Moravian College, 
please reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to talk about the things that you're doing. I'd love to hear what you're doing, Janet. Um, and so, you know, to just be able to build these connections and to talk about the ways that we're employing a lot of these ideas in our day to day, but even to reflect on new ways, right? And new opportunities to think and, you know, really actively choose our lens in this approach in this space, you know, of, of somewhat unusual change um, that we're thinking about things, right? In a way that's encouraging our progression uh, together. So it's been a real joy to be with you. Um, Amanda and Justin, I'll turn it back to you if you have anything that you'd like to add or weigh in. Yeah, yes, Katie. I, I'd just like to add in that that was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed um, the engagement opportunity of, you know, the whole interactiveness of your presentation. I think all of our alumni um, on the call here this afternoon really appreciated that. So as Katie said, any questions that you have or um, anything that you would like to, you know, ask Katie or, or carry the conversation forward, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Amanda. We can get um, you Katie's contact information and um, would definitely be able to continue that conversation. So again, Katie, thanks so much for, for being here and, uh, you know, doing all you do for the college. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone, have a wonderful Saturday night. Enjoy the rest of the night. Is there anything else going on now, Justin and Amanda? How, is this like the close to your session? How do we send everyone off? <laughs> yes, yes. So this was this was the last um, activity for the day. But for those uh, that may be on the call that this was their um, only event that they had registered for throughout the day, please go on to our uh, virtual homecoming videos website at moravian.edu slash virtual homecoming. Uh, we have a few uh, fantastic videos that we also have put together to kind of celebrate the, the weekend and also look for an upcoming announcement regarding save the date for homecoming and reunion weekend 2021 that we will be releasing later this evening. So um, make sure you keep an eye out, um, an eye out for that date and, and save the date for next year. So we hope to be we hope to be able to be together.